Good morning, Grade 7, and welcome to Worksheet Cloud Grade 7 Natural Sciences. If you have a question during the lesson, send an email with your question to grade 7 at worksheetcloud.com. Good morning, my name is Mrs. Hall, and today's lesson is on animal and plant adaptation. So first of all, let's ask ourselves, what is an adaptation? An adaptation is a special feature or behavior that makes an organism particularly suited to its habitat. The adaptations may be general or specific. Now, when we speak about a general adaptation, it's about having legs to walk or fins to swim, something general. However, something specific means the special features so an animal can survive in its environment. And we're going to take an in-depth look at the difference between general and specific adaptations. So let's start with different habitats. Now, a habitat is a place where an animal lives. Okay, so by looking at this picture over here, can you identify different kinds of habitats here. Just take a minute, take a look at this picture. Right, okay, so there are many different habitats where plants and animals can live. There can be a marine habitat, an arctic habitat, a desert which is hot or cold, woodland or forest, river or lake, tropical rainforests, grasslands, it could be a rocky habitat, it could be a bog or a marsh, or it could just be an urban um, habitat, like in your garden or in your park, or it, or it might even be a farmland. Now, the first habitat we're going to take a look at today is a marine habitat, which most of you are familiar with. So, as you know, marine habitats can be the seas and the oceans, and generally they have salty water, and the water can be warm or cold water. The first animal we're going to take a look at is a shark. Now, when you look at a picture of a shark, what are a shark's general adaptations to life in an, in an aquatic environment? So just take a moment there and tell me what you think the general adaptations are over here. So first of all, you can see it has a streamlined shape. This is to reduce friction when moving through the water. It also has gills that have a large surface area so that oxygen can be extracted from the surrounding water, as well as fins uh, to provide stability, power and control. Now remember grade sevens, these are general adaptations. Now let's take a look at specific adaptations to life as an aquatic predator. So the shark has specialized sense organs that can detect the sound, movement and electrical fields of other organisms. Let's just move me out the way there. They have highly sense, um, a highly sensitive sense of smell that can detect drops of blood from miles away, as well as, as well as lots of very sharp teeth that are constantly replaced. They also have a silver coloring underneath, which acts as camouflage. Now, let's take a look at these animals over here as they come up on your screen. What do you think these animals have in common? So just take a look at them. They all have very similar characteristics. Okay. Did you get it? Yes, you did. They all come from colder climates. They are generally Arctic animals. So they have temperatures in the winter which can dip to minus 51 degrees Celsius. The warmest month for them is generally between 10 degrees Celsius and 0 degrees Celsius. There's often permanent snow and ice. So you have to be specifically um, adapted to survive in this kind of habitat and climate. 
So let's take a look at animals in cold climates. They must keep themselves warm to survive. Because, as you know, you lose body heat through your body surface, mainly through your skin. And Arctic animals have developed many adaptations to help them survive in this cold climate. So take another close look at them all as they come up on your screen. And then I want you to think of cold climate adaptations. And I want you to list as many as you can just by looking at these pictures over here. I'm going to give you a second there. Just think about it quietly to yourself. Right, cold climate adaptations. They have to have thick, oily fur coats. They have to have layers of blubber under the skin. They may change color in the summer. They have very small ears. They have large furry feet and they often have a longer snout. They also have a much more rounded body shape. Did you notice all of those adaptations? Right, so let's take another look again. Okay, so now that you see them on your screen, you can see quite clearly, right, they have fat round body shapes with very short legs. And why do you think this is important, grade seven? Okay, there you go, highlighted for you. It's got to do with the surface area to volume ratio. So animals lose their heat from the body surfaces that are in contact with the surrounding air or water. So by reducing the contact surfaces, you reduce the heat loss. Increasing the surface areas increases heat loss. So if I had to put it into terms like this, in scientific terms, a small surface area with the cold climate and a larger surface area with the hot climate. So let's now take a look at hot desert climates. So temperatures here can reach between 45 to 50 degrees Celsius during the day, but they can fall to below 0 degrees Celsius at night. And generally in a hot desert climate, there is less than 25 centimeters of rain in a year. Let's take a look now at the animals in the dry climates. The animals in the dry climates have to keep themselves cool now to survive. They also have to cope with a lack of water. And this means they are unable to lose heat through sweating. Why do you think that's important, grade sevens? Give you a minute there to think about it. Right. Animals that are adapted to desert life are not heavy sweaters because water is so scarce they can't afford to sweat the water out. The spongy bones in their noses absorb any excess moisture to keep every drop of water in. So the air they breathe out is dry air. Interesting. Let's take a look at the animals now from a hot desert climate. What do you think these animals have in common? And look for the hot climate adaptations. And I want you to list as many as you can. So again, take note of the body shape here. Take note of the size of the ears. Okay. And even the length of the limbs. Right. So what do they have in common? And can you list as many as possible of the adaptations that you can see? So, hot climate adaptations, they have large, thin ears, they have little body fat, they have thin, silky fur, long limbs to help spread the heat, they often are only active at night, obviously, because it's cooler, and they have a more elongated body shape. Okay, so look at the body shape here closely. Okay, let's move me out the way again. So there you go, I've highlighted it for you. So 
they don't have a rounded body shape. It's more of a long, elongated body shape. And again, look at the length of the limbs. It's to spread out the surface area. So looking at these two diagrams over here, which shows an animal from a hot climate and which from a cold climate? So look at the body shape, look at the ears, and look at the length of the limbs. Okay, and yes, you guessed correctly. That is cold and that is hot. So we want to increase the surface area in a hot climate and decrease the surface area in a cold climate. So if you had to describe the habitats now and where these two specific animals live and how they can survive, do you think you would be able to do it quite easily, grade seven? So here we have a desert fox and an arctic fox, and it's quite easy to see the differences between the two. And why do I have this little desert <laughs> uh, picture of dessert here? Because I always like to add this into my lessons when I'm teaching grade sevens. Desert is spelt with one S and dessert is spelt with two S's because you always want two helpings of dessert. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of an extra lesson here, grade sevens. Right. Now let's take a look at plants. We're going to start off with plants in cold climates and we're going to start off with the North Pole or land of the midnight sun. It is cold all year except for short periods over the summer. The temperature range is minus 54 to 21 degrees Celsius and countries like Alaska, Siberia and Scandinavia have plants obviously in these kind of cold climates. So, plants are generally smaller here, usually less than 12 inches tall, and this is to avoid the wind. The plants are dark because it helps them absorb heat from the sun, the solar heat. They generally have small waxy leaves or needles, and they are covered with hair. Some plants grow in clumps for protection, and some plants have dish-like flowers that follow the sun. And here you can see them. Okay, we have saxifrage. Hope I said that correctly. Saxifrage, the arctic willow, the arctic flower, and the bearberry. Let's take a look at the trees. Many trees are evergreen, so they stay green throughout the year. Many trees have needle-like leaves this enables them to lose less water. Okay, so less surface area. They have waxy coatings on the needle so that the water can't be lost. And the needles are again dark in color, obviously to absorb the solar heat. The trees have branches that droop downwards. Why do you think that is? Take a look at this picture over here. Okay because obviously then the snow can fall off easier. Now let's take a look at plants in dry climates. Okay, now notice there's a distinct difference between these plants and the earlier pictures of the ones in the colder climates. Now just by looking at them, can you think of any specific adaptations for plants in a dry climate as opposed to plants in a cold climate. So some plants store water in their stems or leaves. They are succulents. Some plants have no leaves in a dry climate. They have very long root systems spread out wide or they go deep into the ground to their absorb water. So shallow to absorb groundwater and deep into the water, uh, deep into the ground to um, absorb water that is in the below the water table. So that grows deep and long into the, the ground. And here we have some pictures. So here you have quite a big stem, okay, obviously to store their water there and then very long roots, okay, to get to the water table, or even shallow roots at the top, okay, to absorb the surface water. So they also have spines to protect them from being eaten by the desert animals. 
The plants are generally slower growing, so they require less energy. And plants that open at night lure pollinators who tend to be active during the night time. They have hair that helps shade the plant and in fact also reduces water loss. Interesting how they're all adapted. Now I want you to take a close look at the photos here. We have a penguin in the water and an eagle flying in the air. Both of them are birds but they live in very different environments that make the penguin adapted for the water and the eagle adapted for flight. Now, how do you think the penguin is adapted to swim in the water? I want you to take a look at its wings. What do you think the wings are used for? Does it have small or large feathers? And how do you think this helps? Okay. Take a second there, take a look at the, the wings and also take note of the feathers. How do you think this will help? It's all going to make sense to you now when I show you. So the penguin is adapted to swim in water as it uses its wings as flippers to swim. And you all know how much faster you swim when you put flippers on. And the feathers are very small and very fine. And this aids it in keeping it waterproof so it doesn't get bogged down by the water. Now let's take a look at the eagle. How do you think the eagle is adapted to fly and catch its prey? And I also want you to take a look at the feathers and the wings. So fish eagles. This specific eagle here has very long wings and long feathers to enable flight and to be able to soar in the air and then swoop down and catch its prey. It's amazing how when you actually look at it quite closely and then you find out the reasons, it all suddenly begins to make sense to you. Isn't it amazing how nature works, grade sevens? As you know, South Africa is home to two very skilled predators, the great white shark and the lion. Both of these animals are very skilled at catching their prey, but in very different environments. Okay, and there we have them. Now, what characteristics do you think the shark has that makes it adapted to living and feeding in the sea? Again, another hint, look at its streamlined body shape and its sharp teeth. So the great white shark is adapted to move very fast through the water as its body is streamlined and it has fins and a tail to swim. It has very sharp teeth to bite into its prey. What characteristics does a lion have that makes it adapted to living and, and hunting in the savannah? Again, another hint, I want you to look at the color of its fur, according to its surroundings, as well as the color of the grass and its very strong limbs. Okay. So as you can see, the line is light brown in um, color, as is, as is its surroundings. So it's camouflaged. It's able to easily sneak up on its prey. And then it has four strong legs with claws to chase and catch and hold down its prey. So, grade sevens, I really hope you enjoyed that lesson and you learned something new today. Um, so, I just have to end off with my normal little jokes and I hope you get them. Um, and here we have um, two horses saying, I can't say I'm entirely pleased with my hip replacement. <laughs> and then over here, what's your mom yelling about? <laughs> Very cute. And then this one, can a kangaroo jump higher than the Empire State Building? Of course it can, because the Empire State Building can't jump. And then I got the moves like Jagger. Grade sevens, have a beautiful day. Um, don't forget to download the worksheet and do your homework and have a great afternoon. Take care and thanks for watching. Just remember, this video was brought to you by Worksheet Cloud.